Good morning. Um, just going to do a quick introduction before handing this over. So, um, welcome, I guess, to the inaugural um, QA track for the IG, IGB-1A Summit. Um, I think really what's important for what we were trying to do here today is that the QA community is completely underrepresented at most of the trade shows that, we, that you see, whether that's you know, GDC to E3, much more retail focused. So this is the beginning of what it is that we're trying to set out for a sort of forum for, to have the discussions. And this is really is about community. So it is, you know, as this gets going, we are looking for input, we're looking for other people to come forward and speak. And whether it is under the IGBA um, banner or whether it's at a separate event, whatever that happens to be, it is about the QA community. So thank you very much for coming and I will hand over. Amy Nanto. I'm the Client Solutions Executive at BMC. Um, it's our honor and privilege to be the sponsor today at the QA track at IGDA. Um, on behalf of Couch of Connect and IGDA, we'd love to welcome you today and uh, thank you so much for being here with us and appreciate your participation and support as well. Um, I'm your MC at the QA track, so if you need anything, have any questions, let me know. I'll be happy to assist you. Um, just to give you a little background on BMC. Uh, BMC, we're a technology consulting company. We provide a full range of QA services in games for all platforms and any languages. So we provide flexible and scalable solutions. Um, our goal is to be able to reach out to our clients and also help them to build a strong QA process in place. So we have a booth right outside and uh, if you have any questions, come by and chat with any one of us. So our focus today is QA, quality assurance. QA plays a huge part in the development cycle. Uh, whether you're a publisher, developer, uh, platform owner, middleware, technology companies, you want to make sure your consumers and your end users that have a great user experience. Uh, especially nowadays, you know, with all these like emerging platforms, um, ever-changing games environment, QA is definitely more important than ever. So today, I think we're going to have some really, really interesting, exciting discussions. Um, thank you for being here again. And um, you know we have some of the uh, the, the the most brightest minds you know in the industry as well with us. So again, I want to dive right in there. So I'll hand it over to uh, our very own and very best Kevin Chelius, and uh, he's going to introduce some of our very good friends from the industry as well. So thank you. Thanks, Amy and uh, Ben. Today's uh, session, we're going to talk about how to improve the, prob uh, the probability of a first pass certification in the PC and console world. I'd like to introduce our, our three panelists. First to my right is uh, Chris Wilson, Director of QA at Activision. He spent the last, and I'm making this up, Chris, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the last 10 to 12 years between Activision and uh, Vivendi, focused on both support and QA. To his right is Lajo Summers, currently at Konami, has spent the last two to three years there? About three years there. Okay, three years. Prior to that, um, had her own consulting company for about four years. Prior to that was Vivendi as well. We all seem to tie back to that company in some way. How long were you there? Eight years? Eight, nine years. Eight, nine years. Okay, very good. And <laughs> Maybe I should have said that. Whoops, that's the cast out of the bag. <laughs> to her right is uh, Peter Cardwell, who is the head of worldwide certification for Microsoft. Has been there, boy, he's got to be close to 11 years. Sorry, I did it, I did it to the others, it's got to happen to you. And prior to that, uh, head of that did the same thing for uh, Codemasters. Okay? Uh, of the three, which one do you think is known to karaoke? To Prince. Oh, wait, that's a different session. Sorry. That's Chris Wilson, though, by the way. I never believe that. <laughs> and if you want to uh, have a very fun car ride, Laja is your expert. Absolutely. I've never been so scared in my life. <laughs> All right, enough about that. Let's move on to the first question. First question I have for you is what are your test perspectives and philosophies for certification? So, take 
that one first? Sure. Um, I don't know, really. It's just, uh, I guess, centralization of tasks um, by one group, uh, be it first party testing, uh, emulation of certification testing, uh, code submission, um, and empowering whoever that third party is to really make uh, code submission and RTM decisions. with Chris, um, and to me, like, one thing that goes hand in hand with the, the certification group is allowing them also to be your, you know, submissions team, so when you, you kind of have the, the power to stop if the game is really not ready for, you know, submission, and have that all tied up in, in one group, that is definitely helpful. Um, I, I think, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank, and I'm following from what Ben said uh, initially, I'd like to thank the organizers of the IDGA and of Casual Connect for giving us this opportunity uh, to speak about the forum. It's a really big thing for the forum. Uh, and as a platform holder, very important to, to the day job that I have. Um, I'd like to welcome you to summer in Seattle. This is as good as it gets, so enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think to answer the question, um, you have to look at two sides of, 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 the, of the same coin. Really, for me, um, the coin in this analogy is, is the game. And, and from the publisher's perspective, uh, the side of the coin that you guys are looking at is really about making your game as good and as polished as possible. Hopefully, that translates into a great engineering experience, translates into a game sale, and a hit title. So from your perspective, you're really talking about QA and how to polish that game. If you flip the coin over and you look at it from the platform holder's side, it's really about conforming to our requirements to ship that product on the platform. That's really about it. It's about conforming to requirements to ship that product. All of us, and I obviously can't speak for Sony and Nintendo, but all of the platform holders have a certain bar. And that bar, they dictate through TCRs or TCRs. Or project, or whatever the requirements of that platform holder are. That's my job. I'm not there to judge quality. I'm not there to judge whether the game is fun. I'm really there about testing the game that you submit to us to make sure that it re re reaches our requirements to ship on our platform or via the live service. So it's really two sides of the same coin, I see. And I think when you understand that philosophy and the difference in approaches that, that we both have as the platform holder and as the publisher, then you really start to get a good view of really what we're trying to achieve. And yeah, they add a little bit more to the philosophy standpoint as well. Uh, we tend to think of it sort of as a, from the publisher perspective and activism, um, sort of as um, the user experience is first. I mean, they're first party requirements, and we definitely understand what they are and understand the spirit of them, which are generally the same across all platforms. It's sort of a consistency of experience uh, among different titles. So. Every time somebody's booting something, it's not handling errors and all this other stuff radically different. Um, and then the protection of um, each individual first party's legal entity, so trademark. Um, At the same time, we think of it in terms of, okay, we know what the black and white you can't do um, in terms of this TRC and or that requirement. But we also try to think what is actually going to be the best end user experience within the constraints of those requirements, um, which I guess makes it easy or easier for me because I don't know what TRC 001 is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but if I do remember what the spirit of it is, I can actually make it as as an other sort of plug and fix it. That's how we do things. I think the other, just if I make the other important factor in that, you know, it's coming to absolutely right, but the other important factor in that is that um, one of my biggest aims, uh, and if you talk to any of my direct reports, um, one of the biggest um, measures that I put in front of them is to really reduce that, that hurdle. Certification, I know, it's a tax. You have to pay to ship that for it. Um, one of my aims, as I say, is to make that tax as small as possible. Um, the way we do that, um, we have an army of people through your account management, your release management, all those, those functions that help uh, design and help you get through certification. But also, um, we constantly review those requirements that are imposed to the generation of the platform. And our aim in certification uh, is really to drive down those requirements. We don't have them needlessly, they're not there just to, to be a deliberate hurdle. 
but we really focus on science and, uh, and I think a good example of that was last year. Um, some of you may know uh, we released this device called Connect for the console. Um, it became the fastest selling consumer electronic product. And yet in that same year we were able to reduce the number of TCRs that we had. So I think that's, that's a major milestone for my team which, which helps to, uh, as I say, reduce that burden. As an outsourced uh, QA vendor, one of the uh, most famous things we get when you get a request is, you know, how can you, uh, the work comes out guaranteed, first pass served, but we move that to ensure. So I think I'll ask the same question to our panel is, what test perspectives and philosophies do you use to ensure first party pass, or first pass certification, sorry. Um, maybe it would help if I went into the overview of how we sort of approach it, I guess. Um, I mean, we start as soon as possible, really. Um, personally, QA at Acquisition starts at Alpha, but really with um, own studios, we sort of start as soon as we can. As soon as we sort of get an idea that a game's doing something new, uh, there's a new peripheral, um, there's some new functionality, um, you know, restoring end user data in some sort of back-end server. And we start reviewing things in paper first, um, making suggestions in terms of save flow uh, as early as possible. Uh, on top of that, we really have um, our code review teams kind of split by console manufacturer. Um, so one, we're always aligning the same contacts at Activision with the same contacts at Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, uh, and Apple, um, even though Apple doesn't really talk to anybody. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no offense if you want to it. So, you know, we do milestone reviews, a formal milestone review process for compliance um, at alpha, beta, and right before code release, um, we're continually sort of reviewing code, and we have a formal um, code submission approval process. It's a three-part process, um, and it requires all three approvals in order to kind of submit, um, and in the case of PC, to um, sip off uh, gold manufacturing. So it basically is the production team, uh, the functional QA team, and then the requirements team that all have to give sort of the green light go. Um, during the review process, the QA team is uh, responsible for communicating uh, with Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo about potential compliance issues, uh, whether or not we don't want to adhere to a requirement because we feel that our game has better functionality as an outline in the requirement. Not that that happens ever. Or, that often. <laughs> or um, if we feel that there's some sort of technical limitation uh, that's going to prevent us from adhering, we try to get those to and in front of first party as soon as humanly possible. Uh, we record everything, so anytime that there's a fail report, a pre serve report uh, from first party, we record it in the fail report database, and any future decision is sort of uh, vetted against sort of what we historically know about it. First party wraps in the code. Thank you. So at Konami, um, I would pretty much follow the same, you know, what you guys heard from Chris, you know. We we would start together, so we had kind of the same, you know, philosophy that we applied, you know, in the previous company before. And it worked for us. So um, one thing I would say is make sure that your developer has the guidelines for each platform. You know, sometimes they, they are really good on the 360, you know, this space, but they know nothing about a downloadable type. What is it? You know, how do I do XBLA now? How do I move to it? Or, you know, they're great at doing the Wii platform, but they have no experience in doing PSN. So making sure that they have the guidelines in front of them. Uh, the earlier that they can implement that, the earlier you can test. Uh, I start with you know alpha, beta, do the same, the same type of um, verification at that time. And almost like every other build, that it is possible for us to run a full pass. That's what we do. It is. You, you're probably going to hear from production, you know, you, you're spending a lot of time testing this, you're wasting my money, I need, you know, let's wait to the end. Why are you going to wait until the end? Then you're going to 
being QA another month with additional overtime trying to fix something that you could have, you know, probably identified early on the process. So, that's what we're Try not to be redundant with Chris here. Uh, just to, I guess, maybe segue a little bit, like the whole um, first pass approval concept of the publisher, I mean, it's diff difficult for me to evangelize it because it doesn't really mean anything to a lot of people other than ourselves in QA, we have pride. Um, but really, I mean, the, the end goal sort of always ends up being, do we make our shit date? And uh, I think it's important as to empower your QA team or whoever ends up sort of taking on this process is really kind of pointing towards what uh, getting first passes really will, or what benefits getting first passes have for, for the publisher. Um, one, when you say something, people trust you because generally you're not throwing crap in their face all the time. So when you do bring up an objection to a, a TRC, TCR, uh, first party sort of um, knows it's coming to them um, as a vetted concept. Uh, the other thing is um, being able to predict your RTM is huge um, and contributing to making your shift date because when if operations knows, hey, if anybody puts this in, our chances of, of getting our calculated RTM are. are, are are higher, then uh, you know that certainly is something uh, that you can use in your organization to sort of help uh, get people behind the concept of cleaner submissions. I think um, really for me, I obviously can't comment as a, as a publisher, but as a first party guy, there are really two key elements to this for me. Um, one is I know sometimes it feels like those first party guys are there just to stop your title. Really not the case. Uh, I know it feels like that sometimes, but really, if you, um, if, you, if you look at my world for a moment, it's all about volume, scalability, because I deal with every title, whether it's on the console, whether it's on the phone, or whether it's on the PC, they all come through my team, so there's huge scalability and huge volume. Um, and it's all about, um, I, I actually don't want to fail any titles, because it then becomes a further burden for me. Not only does that type of event have to come back through, and therefore pitching it cost me more money to do that, um, and it takes up another appointment slot in, in my appointment calendar. So, and, and in doing that, obviously it prevents somebody else from taking that slot. So there's really a number of factors there that, that help to drive me to help to get publishers uh, through at the first time pass rate. But to the point that both Vardia and Chris mentioned, a lot of it comes down to your measures and what really drives your QA teams and your business. Is it uh, just to achieve your street date um, and, and make sure that you're RTM on time? Or is it to really get through certification the first time? Um, I've worked with a number of publishers who have different metrics. And if they drive their QA teams around the goal of getting a first time pass rate, and then link that to the individual metrics of the individuals in test, the test lead, the test managers, and so on and so forth, hey, guess what? You suddenly start to see that they start to achieve those goals. If, however, your goal is just to ship the product and meet the delivery date, then you know, that's another set of goals. So it really does depend upon how you organize your test of business. Well, you have to actually gain trust, though, because no one trusts QA. And I think the biggest thing that happens <laughs> is that, um, you know, you have a production team or operation team or whatever, they're, they're looking at the RTM, and there's all this risk around sort of like what piece of team might find that my team didn't find. So in order for me to be able to draw that line, I have to be damn sure that like my guys have identified anything that could potentially be found by your guys. And so I guess that takes time. Like you don't just get that overnight. Uh, you sort of have to um, establish a proven track record of making the right call. Um, see, I think like I understand your philosophy, right? And for a publisher like Activision, they cannot afford, you know, to go to X amount of submissions because... No, we can't, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, we you can afford it like, monetarily, but, but we can't afford it to right, submit right. all day long. You know what I'm saying is, like, for a, a small publisher, a developer that doesn't have all that kind of cash, right? It's like, you fail, you know, if you're going to a third submission, you have to pay, what, $35,000, and then now we go three, four, five, it's 35, 35. Shut down your QA. No, no, the you know point is, I mean? though, I guess, when, we, when you're talking about code submission, and, and again, we don't do that. You know, it's five times out. Um, <laughs> just to clear the record. Right <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the initial problem with sort of being able to hold a quality bar 
is it's always the unknown. People want to submit to find out what they don't know. So if you're looking and you're looking at a review cycle at Microsoft, it takes like roughly 10 days or 7 days to reply them. And there is basically, we're on day 20. Production is like, okay, we have just enough time for two submissions, let's put it in, I don't care what bugs are open. Because they want to know what he's going to tell them. Now, we are at the point in our organization that we don't do that because we have established trust. But I don't know where everyone else is. Uh, that's a hurdle that we had to overcome to get to the point that we can have QA say no. I say no all the time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Research is a good thing. Research are good. They are your friends. A couple of you have touched on this and maybe you want to expand on this a little further, but how do you organize your, your certification teams? Uh, they're organized by platform. So Basically, there is a, a lead that's sort of responsible for all things that happen on a particular, um, not even hardware platform, more so a first party entity. Same way. Um, so we have a lead for each um, first party, then testers under that lead, uh, a coordinator that, you know, makes sure that everything's kind of running together. And, that coordinator reports back to me. I'm very much hands on. Yes, I like the uh, analogy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to keep moving because I know. I'm, that's, I'm sorry, sorry, I, I have a point. I, I'd <coughs> love to hear from you guys on that topic. I really would because a lot of people ask me how I set up my test teams because, hey, I'm certification and first party guys, so if they're doing it that way, I'm going to copy it. Um, there's no secret sauce with, with, with my business. Um, essentially, um, I have a number of test leads. The job of that test lead is as soon as that submission comes in, um, sometimes it's a pre cert sometimes it's an emotional final, what have you. Um, their job, their task, is to really understand that title and the information that's provided in the release management team um, and build the team around how we're going to test that. The biggest criteria that my team have in determining that is our SLA, as, as Chris mentioned. We have somewhere between seven to ten days, all we have. And in that seven to, eight, seven to ten days, we've got to get through that game as fast as possible. Cover as much ground in that title as we possibly can. That dictates how many people we put on it, how many testers, how many leads, so on and so forth. Um, but it really is the individual job of the test lead of Microsoft to determine what resources we're going to put on the title. And it, it varies, it depends whether you're getting a demo, it depends whether it's an okay title, it depends whether it's a connect title. You know, really, really is variable. So there's no sort of, as I said, no fixed number of, of testers we apply to a title. It varies hugely depending upon that title. Um, but, um, as I said, I, I really would be interested to hear how you guys have a lot of that challenge. <coughs> I don't know if that was a challenge or wait to see me afterwards, but... No, 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 see me after the pass, I'm here for the rest of the day. So <laughs> stop me, stop me, stop me, let me know. I'm really interested in that topic. Thank you. Yeah. Have you adjusted your teams due to, or process due to digital distribution? Uh, we did. Uh, what we found is uh, a lot of digital distribution efforts were driven out of North America. So we'd submit content and we'd submit it um, particularly to Microsoft with North America in mind, and then what would happen is, you know, like, oh, that offering should be a global offering, and then it's a lot of, it was a little, I think some hurdles to get yeah. content recropped and, and sort of retagged and whatnot. So as a standing process, we sort of treat everything as if it's going to be global, as it makes sense. Um, I don't know how to explain this, I guess I gotta be in dumb. So like, we'll have like a, a marketing incentive, like we're gonna do gamer picks in, in North America um, for our, Farm Warfare 3. And instantly, our team will go, okay, well, we know this title is going to be shipping in these territories, so they'll take charts, get the localized strings for all the cell text, and sort of make sure that becomes a global incentive automatically. Um, from a test standpoint, um, John John is uh, my manager in terms of all certification teams. I don't know if, we're, if I'm missing anything from a test standpoint. I don't think we've changed anything radically. No, definitely not for I got it. Sorry. I got it. <laughs> no worries. 
What do they call that? The game scale when you uh, diversion? No, no diversion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say the one thing that I changed was not really the process, but the environment. Um, make sure to try to duplicate as much as you know the different bandwidth that we have, like in the lab with <coughs> you know Sony and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> um, making sure also like. Multiplayer is tested and trying to have that implemented way early in, in the process because that's one thing that always, you know, holds us back from submitting on time. There's several issues, you know, that goes with with that. Um, so we spend a lot of money making the, the environment ready for that and try to, you know, see what we can find before Sony and Microsoft tell us. So I think there's two answers to, to Kevin's question. One is on teams and one is on process. Um, the first part on teams, uh, no, we don't change the teams, whether it's a disk-based product or a digitally distributed product. Uh, that factor doesn't influence the team choice at all, as I said previously. The big factors that influence team are what type of game it is and can we meet our SLA. SLA is very important to me how my team achieve that. Those are the big drivers in terms of how we back to our teams. Second part of the question was around the process. Do we change our process? Obviously we do. Um, that's the biggest change. Um, it's faster, obviously. We're not waiting on uh, disk replication. We're not waiting for the AR to manufacture the physical disk and ship it back. Um, with a disk-based product, you, you, you are subject to that delay. You're physically manufacturing a, a product which is going to be ultimately the finished product that the consumer buys, we have some final checks uh, put in place for that physical media, both with our team and with the publisher. We both receive those discs. Um, with digital products, we don't have that, that physical constraint. So it is a faster process. So yes, yeah, the process is changed. Uh, for teams, no. Thank you. The next question centers around when you, when you start looking at CERT. And I know there's a, there's a fine line between the earlier better your chances for uh, first first pass. But at Plaza, you mentioned before some of the smaller companies uh, struggle with the financing component of that. Could, could you address address that one a bit? At what yes. point do you look at, sir? Uh, I started looking like from you know alpha even before that, and I don't say okay, uh, I don't have everything implemented in the game, or I need to have you know a week of testing. No, comes in. You have you know, a clear idea of what suppose it is implemented. So if that's going to run like a day, you know, to do a pass or four hours, you put that feedback in. Um, some of the developers like they don't have the experience. What we do is I send out, you know, really good testers that have a good understanding of all the certification guidelines, also FTCs and functionality because it is a combination of everything. You just don't want to say, oh, I, if I follow A to Z, my game is going to pass and that's all I care about. No. The, you know, the name of the department and, and what we do and the focus is quality. And it has to be, you know, that combination. So we send out testers to work with the developer and, and try to help them out and identify the issues before it even gets to QA. So that has been proven to us like, you know, a great, great success in the bottom line, save some money, right? Yeah, I mean, as soon as the game's ready to be looked at, as soon as individual features are ready to be looked at, um, it, it's all helpful. Um, you know, we'll send uh, teams to developers as well. Um, and with the own studios, um, it's easy to get involved, uh, you know, well before alpha. So you're actually sort of finding bugs on paper as opposed to once they're actually in or making suggestions of how to do things that will hold. I also see, yeah. So I obviously can't come in on behalf of the publishers, but, but I can give a piece of general advice um, as, as a tip that we've seen um, from publishers who have submitted in the past. Um, and that's really that you want to give yourself as many options as possible. So in other words, what that means is 
you don't want to wait until the final submission to find out how we're going to fail your title. As <laughs> <laughs> Christian Vardier both mentioned, if you can align your test teams to run through those technical certification requirements or those requirements from any of the platform holders, that's a really, really good thing to do. The earlier you do that, the more options you leave open to yourself. Yeah. You can contact your RM, you can talk about some of the issues with the platform, and you can discuss what your options are. If you leave that till your final product um, certification date, the options are pretty limited at that point. So really, you know, um, just a general tip from what we've seen I think that's a, a great segue into the next question is, you know, what things can, can we do, do you do, um, to help improve our past perception? Um, what I, I'm a true believer the training is the key. So making sure that, the, you know, the staff that you have allocated to, you know, the platforms they are trained and properly trained, uh, I take them to Microsoft and you know, Sony, Several times you make sure that they know what they're doing, and these guys are your friends, right? So if you have questions, send an email, phone call. If we have weekly calls um, with, you know, all first parties, so make sure that any question they have, you do, you know, do ask. It's like get your team really, you know, prepared to go through what the work they have to do. To, to do. Um, another thing that's important, and, and I went through economy, you have to educate your production team as well as your developer, right? Because we all know it's always QA's fault, right? <laughs> and when you try to implement something that, you know, to ex kind of explain and show them the results that you're going to have, you, you need to educate them the why and how that's going to benefit, you know? QA is part, is working with them, is not working against them, right? We all want to. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, my I'm that we used to be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just had that class that self expression time. That's the first time. No, no, I'm just like, bring it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, we're constantly doing new things and trying new things. Um, just to, I guess, stay ahead of the curve. Um, the thing that I think that we've learned recently is dealing with um, the same engine on franchises, you get to learn sort of the limitations of the engine. Uh, so, you know, we've proactively engaged development teams on like waivers that we've gotten for the past iteration of the title. Hey, have you guys gotten this um, sort of sorted out? Um, that way, before we even see a title, we actually know what. what? <laughs> oh, it's a level two tip. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here. Sorry, no more level two tips for you. I'm just taking notes here, Chris. I mean, everyone has signed an NDA. It's not like, you know, either they fixed it or they didn't fix it. But they can't do it. They can't do it. So you know, you know before you even see the game, you know, that it's X titles going to require Y titles. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 We try to engage, like, hey, can you guys maybe, you know, address this issue? And if not, then we sort of put that in front of the first party well before uh, code submission. Um, the other thing, too, is we actually know where games tend to be sort of weak. Um, so we're... You do? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're doing weird stuff. Like, we're using dev tests, and I'm not trying to, to, to advocate dev tests. You can do this really with any sort of test suite tracking software. But over the course of the test cycle, we're looking and seeing where the game is falling down and focusing our injuries there, as opposed to taking like the like, you know, 1,500 or 3,000 hours, depending on whatever game it is, all on just covering all the requirements all over the place. Oh, it's, you know, X developer, we're going to kind of focus on save flow, or if it's this developer, and we've done like, you know, our first like three or four sweeps, we notice, hey, look at, they're not handling sign-in changes gracefully, so we'll put some more energy towards that. So. I guess getting smarter about what we're doing as opposed to just like throwing like all in, all in, all test cases every single time. Um, one, because I have a budget I have to meet, and two, there's an improvement. There's a finite, finite, finite amount of time uh, to review things. So, right, so I, think, I think that it, that is you know certainly doable 
in your guys' days in a lot of like you know the big culture where you're using you have your studio and using the same engine you know for different types of um, the types that you do for the smaller um, you know developers and publisher that's kind of a little harder to to do but making sure that you really start putting your knowledge base together you know normal um, failing <laughs> reports um, that that will give you know that's a really good starting point. Keep track of that for you know X B L A title. This issue usually happen with this and you know type engine that the developer is using. So even if, if you are outsourcing, right, you can ask your outsourcing partners to help you out in, in provide the, uh, that information. <laughs> I did not instruct her to say that. That's the word. I think it's a great question, Kevin, and I did actually make a, a, a few notes uh, when, when I heard you ask the question. I think, so I can get a little bit philosophical on this topic, but I, I think that you guys actually have a big part to play in getting the answers you need. Um, you are um, a big influence in terms of making platform holders responsible for providing you with the services you need to pass the application process. Um, you need to be asking questions like, as Claudia said, what are the top 10 failing topics? And what are the top 10 failing TCRs or functional issues? Let me know so that I don't trip up. Every, I can guarantee you every platform holder will have them. Yes, they know do. what they are. Yeah? You should ask for them. You should also ask for what um, what, what, what are my main contact points in the business? If I have uh, marketing or business related issues, who do I talk to? If I have development uh, or coding issues, who do I need to go and talk to? If I have certification and test issues, who do I need to go and talk to? You really need to know who those people are that you need to get to. Um, and of course, Microsoft do a number of events throughout the year to help to provide a point around training and education. Yeah? You should be asking for those making sure that the first party platform holders are delivering that content for you to go and improve the test teams. Um, you have a big voice, you have a big collective voice. Um, you have a big influence there. Thank you. Next question is, when a game does fail, God forbid, um, <laughs> regardless of the platform, Microsoft, Sony, or Nintendo, what kind of things would you suggest that you need to do it that people can do immediately? The first thing, um, make sure that your QA team can reproduce all the issues on the report. Uh, I think the first and foremost, I don't know the background, I probably should ask this, like, I don't know who I'm talking to. I mean, obviously not each individual, but the spread of people in the room are QA, maybe Dev, Dev QA, Publisher QA, Producer, Other. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, for me and my team anyway, uh, it's really important to make sure that we can, I don't know why that context got pains on my answer. But uh, <laughs> you just want to I just know. wanted to know. Just want to know. Uh, but I don't know, it's important for us to be able to reproduce everything on the reports. Um, one, because sometimes there are invalid bugs on reports, or sometimes the repro rates on the reports aren't as high as stated, or sometimes they are as high as stated, but require an additional step that may not have been outlined in the report. So you can waste a lot of time having a developer try to kind of fix something that they're not really fixing. Um, the other thing, I took notes on this, I don't know why I can't read them. Um, you have to engage all your stakeholders on the report, so um, before you're in this big rush to go back and say anything to, to Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, Apple, whoever, um, sort of get an alignment on what you think about what, what you're reading, you know, are these issues that you really want to release your title with um, from a QA perspective, from a production perspective, from a development perspective, um, and maybe that's some mix, maybe there's some issues that, yeah, you know, these are a big deal, these aren't, um, but get all those opinions, um, particularly the sales opinion um, is important here, and uh, then come back with a sort of unified response, you know, hey, we're going to fix these, we'll fix this. Um, we don't want to fix anything. I mean, I guess it really all depends on sort of what types of issues pop up and what you want to, I guess, your game look like on so. Yeah, I agree 1,000%.
uh, I think it's very important for you to read the report and make sure that you have the same understanding that you know the first party has, because sometimes we're not in agreement, and that's when you know it, it's very important to, uh, to really understand. Do, do we have you know the same outlook? Are we understanding this? How you know the same one? Uh, after that, go to your developer. You know, try to replicate that bug. Talk to the to the developer. Say, okay, what do you see on the you know on the back end? In do talk to first party. You know what I mean. Um, negotiate. <laughs> That's the key word here, right? I mean, we've had issues that actually were more severe than what was reported by first party. We get the, the exactly. issue back, and then we start looking into it more, and like, oh wow, that's like, you know, global, or that's uh, not as isolated as it may have appeared in the report. And we actually will pull stuff that are, any, I'd say any report, even if it's a fail or a pass, make sure that the QA team regresses all the bugs. Right, um, you know, we do have instances where even though it is already in submission, they're testing, we're testing and suddenly run into something like, oh, stop. We pulled the, the type out of, you know, submission and said, sorry, you may be, you know, you're already fast and we're going to QA now, but we need to fix it. So there are instances that, that will also happen. I think it's another great question, Kevin. I guess the natural reaction at the point of failure is to run around with your hair on fire and try and fix everything. Um, don't do that. <laughs> That's the reaction which you want to prevent. Um, really, you really need to take the time and, and look at the options that you have. Um, one of the, the, the interesting things that we've developed as the industry has evolved over the last couple of years is to really try and not fail titles. I know this is going to sound a bit of a cliche, but really, again, it comes back to that, that first point that I made around, we really actually don't want to pay our titles. So before you get yourself into a situation where your title is going to fail, you really need to be evading that platform holder of all of the, the, the breadth and wealth of services that they provide and really get ahead of that failure in the first instance. Um, if ultimately you do fail, um, you have a number of options. Obviously, it depends upon how severe the title has failed, but you do have a number of options. And one of the first things that, that, that we do um, initially, and we've changed over the last few years in terms of our stance, is we won't initially fail a title right now. Um, we know that everybody's human, everybody makes mistakes, and so for minor infringements now, um, we will place a title on hold and we'll engage the release manager in a dialogue with the publisher to address the issue. Maybe an age rating is, is the wrong age rating or the age rating is not there. Um, it may be the save game format is not there or is corrupt. Or it's, whatever the issue might be, there may be a, a simple fix that we can, we can you know, talk to the release manager, engage with you, um, get that fix in place and put you straight back into test. You don't lose any time um, with those simple errors. But again, it, it depends upon the severity. So if it's small, then we can absolutely place the title on hold. If it's big, then obviously it depends upon the issue and, and engage with, with your release manager at that time. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll ask one more question and open it up uh, to the rest of you for questions to the panel. Um, just, just a real quick one, if, if we can do that. Um, but what type of things would you suggest for a small developer or a smaller company, the things that they can do to help get them through the certification process, regardless of the platform? Want me to go? Yeah, sure. um, I don't know. I'd say read first party documentation is crucial. Um, and depending on how small your organization, I mean, that might go all the way back to concepts, all the way through code submission. But make sure that you sort of know what needs to happen every step of the way. Um, in order to get your title from sort of like this uh, concept to, to an approved uh, manufactured entity. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest is um, make sure that you address, well, make sure that your release manager understands what your game is, what it does, um, so there are no surprises uh, that come up later, particularly if you're doing something new. 
um, that's never been done before, or not many people have done. Um, but the last thing that you want is um, there to be some, especially when they're having these high level talks, this happens actually a lot, where you have these execs talking and they're getting these like, you know, handshake sign offs, and then when it comes down to the, the rubber meets the road, Oh, your game does this weird thing. What you can't? This is going to cause. So you just have to make sure it's it's clear to communicate um, all the way through the cycle. Um, address issues that come up in, in concept as well. Um, they won't go away. Um, and trust your QA. And if you are the QA team, doubt your teams. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say, know the guidelines. You know, reading. Understand that, um, take advantage of training, communicate with the first party, know your, you know, them, developer account manager, they have great help in the initial phase and all the way to, like when you're implementing things like new, you know, peripherals, whatever the case may be. Um, implement the guidelines as soon as you can. Do stuff earlier on rather than like that. And I think we always like focus on TCRs, TRCs, but don't forget your FTCs. They are very helpful. Very, very helpful. And sometimes you'll be surprised the you fa you fail your game because of an FTC that somehow, oops, we forgot. No, we didn't do this time. And it was you know, you had the material right there. So, um, I think there's, there's, for me, certainly there's five key lessons from this, okay? So, pen, paper, here we go, big ten. First one, preparation. Preparation. Um, I think as, as, as both Claudia and Chris have mentioned, um, preparation is, is a lot of the key. Getting ahead of this. Um, take the time to prepare for certification and make sure that you align your testing. The testing, whether it's internal or external, make sure you align your testing with the testing from that platform holder. Okay? And make sure that before you submit to that platform holder, you run a formalized set of submission checks based upon the guidelines from that platform holder. Really important to do that. Even if it's just to tell you where you're going to fail, at least you know it's a game that gives you options. Secondly, communication. Communication is vitally important in all aspects of your life. Even more so when you've got money involved and you're hitting a deadline. Yeah? Really, really super important that if you have an external QA company or you're working with a vendor that you're talking, my, my, my key mantra there is a little and often. Make sure you're talking daily around deliverables. Make sure you're talking daily around bug counts, where you are in terms of output and those. And so a little and often. Um, and really, top tip here is to make sure that you have a single point of contact working with that vendor. Quite often, it's not the data itself that's important, but the flow of that data. Making sure that that data gets to the right people who can make decisions based upon it. Third point, know your sources for help. I mentioned this earlier. Bit of an assumption on my part. I'm basing that assumption on Microsoft. But I'm sure that each of the platform holders has an army of people ready to help you through the whole release and certification process. Know who those people are. If you have development issues, know who you can go to for those. If you have coding and, and, and certification test issues, know who you need to go to for that help know who you need to get to for marketing and release and shipping help. Really know who are your sources of help are for each of the platform holders and make sure you use them. Fourth, submission knowledge. Really, really, really sit, take the time to sit down and make sure you understand the submission requirements for each of the platform holders. Not just in terms of submitting your game bits, but all of the other materials and equipment that go with it. Um, age rating submission file requirements that we need, save games. It's often that little stuff that gets overlooked and where publishers make mistakes. So really make sure that you understand those requirements. And finally, analyze your failure data. Successes are great, uh, successes are good. 
but some of the biggest lessons we can learn are from failures. So again, make use of the top 10 TCR or FTC failure issues that each of the platform models has. Make sure you understand from your own failure issues. And make it a mantra of your own that you'll never fail that issue again. Learn from those mistakes. One thing I'd like to, um, to add to that is that when, when you have a team, like say they, you know, you're working with for X amount of time and, and their success rate is kind of high, uh, don't just take that for granted. Um, I constantly evaluate my team and I test them. How do I do that? I send, you know, a title that I'm testing. It's fully done in-house, but I outsource a little portion to, you know, one of the companies just to see if my team is still performing as well as I'm thinking. Right? That's just sneaky. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, I like it. I do. It I, I helps mean, you keep that quality Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's another level of, you know, insight and feedback that you want to get to evaluate your team. They might not like it, but that's life. Thank you. I want to be respectful of everyone's time as well as the next group that's going to be coming in here. So I want to open it up to questions. What kind of questions is, do you have for our panel? Hey, Peter, I just wanted to... Uh, you mentioned that, uh, that your objective was to not fail titles, so I know we're fully aligned there in a the company like that. <laughs> but, uh, but really, it's about aligning how our test teams think. And, and that, so I'm interested, when you're standing in front of your certification team, the, the folks who are you know, inside our games, testing our games, what do you communicate to them about you know, what, what you're looking for from them and their objectives? It's a good question. Um, and again, it comes down to, I think it was the very first question where I, I, I spoke of the coin and the two sides of the coin. It really is difficult because we try wherever possible not to get involved in design, game design related issues. Fundamentally, that's your IP, your game design, your great title. Um, but occasionally, you know, they, they, the two do conflict. And that's where, again, a lot of the, the, the conversation today has been around negotiation and discussion. Um, yeah, my, my team, I make it very clear to them that whatever we test, you should be able to test. So it's very, very clear to me that all of the tools we have uh, and have within the certification team, whether it be compliance or functional, you guys get access to. I can't make you use them, but there's a big, big note of advice that I should you know, try and make good use of them. Um, we also make sure that we are very clear on all of the technical certification requirements. I, I have to be a little bit careful that I don't delve too deeply into NDA information here, but, um, but know that for every rule or requirement that we have, I explicitly set the goal with my team that you should disseminate that rule or requirement and make it into something that you can physically test. So in other words, if the rule is, you know, thou shalt not break the speed limit, um, we actually give people guidance on how you test for that scenario, how you make sure that you don't break the speed in it. Using a bad example, but you get the case. Thanks. Um, besides the, the tools and resources that are provided by the uh, first party, um, what, what sort of things do you guys internally do? So, like, for instance, uh, in my company, there's just three of us who do all the uh, CERT testing, and we've created an internal wiki that basically has all the test cases for each platform, um, the, you know, the test steps, uh, basically like, kind of like a reproduction of the document with um, the inclusion of the past tales from the data reports. Um, do you guys have any other like internal things that you do to be constructed to help you test for your partner's requirements? So actors only have three things. Um, well, we have the, the test cases that we have, which are basically um, elaborated versions of the first part requirements where we actually amend them with our own sort of steps to replicate the, uh, the error condition. Uh, we have a fail report database, which anytime, actually it's just really a first party report database, which is organized by title, by platform, and by submission version. And so um, 
if at any point someone wants to, you know, not fix, will not fix one of our bugs, we can quickly query, okay, how many times is that reported across pre-labs, across um, this title, across whatever, and sort of give a gauge whether or not that issue was found to be a low, a CFR, yada, yada, yada. So it helps us. What sort of software do you use for creating that? You know what we teach? We just use our, our just any bug okay. database would work. Um, and then we also have a, I probably shouldn't admit this, but uh, we track the waves that were requests from first party and we organize them the same way. So we know whether or not, what our likelihood of getting a similar request um, for another time. We meant to say air mouse, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I think we're about out of time. We'll just go with one more. Um, well, the requirements piece that ACT was then folds up into the entire QA assessment, which is basically a, a, a formal alpha and beta fail. So usually, if alpha is failing, um, there's a flag that's set. Um, we have this uh, weekly um, sort of skew status call where we discuss all the games that we're releasing and what the upcoming milestones are. So generally, um, to avoid going on blast, in, in like the executive calls, people will have some sort of like plan to, to rectify whatever the situation is. So one of our alpha requirements is um, for requirements, it's pretty easy. It's basically um, safe load is, is implemented and working, um, and some subset of requirements are implemented. The beta milestone, which is the one that really sort of gets that's fire in people's ass, is the, um, the basically, yeah, the technical <laughs> term, it is basically um, ready for um, pre certification testing, um, the games in final formats, um, whatever that is for the, the particular platform. So when we announce, hey, you know, beta failed and it failed for the functional deliverables and it also fails for the, the pre-cert deliverable, then that triggers a larger discussion because the pre-cert has to have 30 days before the final. If the pre-cert is pushing out, then what does that mean about the final? So um, yeah, we have daily reports, we have weekly reports, we've got, we've got reports coming out of the Yazoo. Yes. One report, and it, it, it's, you know, let's say they tell you, you know, the famous thing, don't test. We are not ready for you to test this. Okay, I'm not doing the full certification, but testing is happening, right? So you do a quick evaluation and say, okay, X, Y, and Z is not implemented, and we have this time, you know, to go into beta. So most likely, it's not going to happen. Then you push back to the developer, like, what is your timeline? When is going to be implemented? Because we need X amount of time, and based on you know other titles that had the same flow, this much time happens. So you, that's where you start putting the fire, you know, and pushing back to the developer. It's actually a really good question. Um, and if you're around, we can talk about it later on. But it's actually very demographic of the nature of the business changing. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we are constantly trying to drive down that, that hurdle of certification so that we can pass. But what we're seeing now is a lot of publishers asking us to be more hard to fail so that it gives the QA team the testing the ammunition to go back to the dev teams to fix things to make the most of the right results because otherwise they won't and publishers are starting to ask those questions look, you need to help us uh, get hardcore and so we can send that message back and give us the ammunition to do that. I think if you track it too, I don't know how many titles you guys do a year, but you can start actually forming that yeah, too.
time and dollar amount. They that they get they pay them very quickly. Okay, well, I think we're we're out of time by a few minutes here. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for for coming and participating. I want to thank the ICA for allowing us to run this, Ben for pushing this for many years, and most importantly, our three panelists. So thank you very much.